ATPI, delivering what really matters. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of the Speed Freaks Chat Show with myself, Scott Nichols and Brando, all brought to you by ATPI Travel, our title sponsors. Now the show is all about Speed Freaks and Legends Of, and we've got one of the proper legends of the sport. Who we got, Brando? Well, the man who until recently was the voice of BT Sports Motor GP coverage, the voice and face of World Superbikes and World Championship Speedway on Sky Sports, and... Barry Sheen's former teammate. It's Mr. Keith Hewitt. Welcome to Speed Freaks, sir. How are you? A couple of freaks looking after me today, then. I can't wait. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, strap in. <laughs> all righty. Well, okay. Let's get back to where it all started then, Keith. Um, road racing, that's your background. Um, but I believe you're a little bit of a late bloomer. So how did the, where did the Speed Freak obsession come from? It's always been that way. I mean, obviously, uh, you go back to... It's usually a bit of parental, isn't it? There's certain things you get off your parents, your bad temper, your you know, lack of money, all those kind of situations. And, and for all of us, it's, it's motorbikes, isn't it, in one way, shape or another. Yeah, it's, I think modern day racers are, are really, they follow that as a career, whereas I think the likes of us, and I'm roping you in on this as well, Scotty, that, 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 that we kind of just, it was the environment that, were, that we were in. I mean, my old dad had bikes. My mum's brother had bikes. That's obviously where the comp- competitive side of it came from because obviously he was a speedway rider. Well, not obviously, but he was for those that don't go back quite that far as I do. Um, and I always, I never wanted to go on the dirt, which was straight. I was, I was all right on the dirt. I could, I was, was reasonable on the dirt, but never really a, didn't feel like it was going to be something I was actually particularly good at. But as soon as I got on tarmac, everything changed. Um, obviously, obviously, I like it nice and clean. We talk about the racing. Um, but obviously you said you didn't like the dirt so much and it was always the clean stuff, hence the road racing. But as far as I'm aware, there's not really much of a, an early transition for a road racer. So where did you cut your teeth? What was the motorbikes and stuff that you actually learned your trade on? It was all dirt bikes. I mean, like Uncle Alan, Alan Cowland, as was my mum's um, brother, um, obviously, when he moved up to Northamptonshire, which was sort of a bit uncut back in the day, it was a proper one-horse town, Northampton, back then. And um, I'd come up and stay with him as a kid, and uh, and we'd go out over the trails and bits and pieces like that. And and as well, back then, I mean, bridleways meant motocross track, as far as I was concerned, anyway. Um, nowadays, they'd have a helicopter over you and, and clap you in irons if you went anywhere near like where, where we went or used to go. Um, I'm obviously not encouraging that because it will be a problem for everybody. But back in the day, you could get away with doing whatever you want, go wherever you want on a motorbike, just everywhere. It was just such good fun back in that that particular time. And Alan used to build bikes for me, so I'd always have something that was pretty useful. I wasn't really good on the dirt. That's all there was to it. And I used to, I obviously used to trail around everywhere, go to speedway meetings with, with Al, everywhere we went. I mean, from Exeter all the way to the, to, the, to Sheffield. Um, but the one thing that always used to put me off, I've got to say, this is going to sound really strange, but the changing rooms. How the <laughs> hell, how the hell does any self, I mean, honestly, it's like bloody Caligula. Everybody in there getting changed and bloody willies flying around everywhere. It was just, as a kid, You've been I was in the element key, I'll be doing any of that. <laughs> hey, we ain't got change rooms right now. COVID smacked that one shut. So we're um, Go home dirty. Old school, back in the van like it was in the grass track days. But you, you, you talk about travelling around with Alan, you talk about having fun on motorbikes and sort of learning to ride them, what you like, what you don't like, but where does, the, where does that transfer into having a racing bug or a desire to go and test yourself in a sort of formal environment against other people? Right from a push bike days, you know, as, long, as far back as you want to go, whenever I got on a push bike, I always wanted to beat everybody else around me, and I'm sure that there will be, I don't think I would be unique in that. Now, if we went round the block on push bikes, I had to beat whoever I was with. And it, it just, it didn't feel like an obsession. It didn't feel like something I was doing. I just wanted to do it. Always wanted to beat everybody. Bad loser? Yeah, I probably am. Uh, gracious loser, I would hope as well. But but 
it's something you, you know when you've got competitive kids you know you try to teach them to be gracious in winning and great you know humble in winning and gracious in losing but you've got to win it's trying to trying to tell your kids when they come back from school and they're told that taking part is all that matters you know sport is sport it's it's you're there to win it but it's the way that you win and the way that you lose that counts from my own personal point of view so i've always taught my kids don't listen to the teachers when they say it's only about taking part. It's not. It's about winning. You know, to your last breath, to your last step, you've got to try as hard as you can, right to the line, whatever it is. But if you lose, do not throw a tantrum because you're not going to be in favour with me on that one. And if you win, win humbly. Don't rub people's noses in it. Don't be awkward. With, you know, don't don't show off. Just do the winning. That's the bit that counts, in my view. If you're if you're then in that position, so you've then decided dirt's not for you, tarmac's for you you start racing, that competitiveness, how quickly does that form an ambition to get to there, there, there? <laughs> Speak to Scotty. He's there all the time. It never goes away. You dream it at night. You sleep, you wake up with it. It's not something that, that's, that's conscious. It's just there all the time. It's uh, and Again, I don't think I'm unique in this. I think everybody, and again, it depends, you know, level. What did I win? I won British Championships. Never won a world title. Never won a, a Grand Prix, which was to, to this day still winds me up that I never did because I should have done, really. Um, but the point being is I didn't. You try your hardest to the level you're at. You know, wherever that is, whether it's luck that's against you, whether it's finance that's against you, whether it's talent that's against you, it can be any of them combinations. But never leave anything on the table the ethos is to never leave one thing on the table never look back and think i could have done that i could have been faster or i could have done this that or the other in my case you know there's a certain amount of funding that went with it there's a certain amount of you know timing that was bad luck in certain circumstances i ran into to like so many did into uh like we're having now with the covid situation people are really struggling with that well we ran into a a, a, a world finance problem at the time when when the whole bottom dropped out of the market commercially for everything Tracks were closing, teams were shut in, you know, and that was the end of me as a, as a professional motorbike racer. Well, obviously, on this show, we, you know, we're talking about speed freaks. We might have a bit of fun, but also what really intrigues me is, is what makes that person tick. Now, you've just really hit the nail on the head about the competitiveness, about being first up the stairs, always wanting to win everything. Um, but weirdly, kind of, one, where does that come from? Has that come from one of your parents? But also... Um, like now the psychology of the sport, now there's so much emphasis on it. So back in your day when you were riding, were there many people that were really in tune with the whole mental aspect or was it just pure grit and determination? It was exactly that. I mean, I come from an analogue generation at the end of the day. Uh, there was nobody in my family, my direct family, that was competitive apart from Alan, you know, Uncle Alan. You know, was it the fact that I spent time at speedway tracks? Yeah, it probably was. I always wanted a bit of that. You know, I could see that. That bloody checkered flag business is is intoxicating. It's what we all want to do. And Speedway, it's got that wonderful aura about it, Speedway. I love Speedway. It's down to earth, very, very, very basic, um, but it's bloody competitive. And the cutthroat side of it is just a bit, it's raw. And I enjoyed it as a kid. I like that side of it. Once you start moving into the road racing stuff, it starts to become a little bit more political, a little bit more... You know, you have to be a bit more on your metal regarding the psychology of things. <laughs> Psychologist, I'd have been better off going to the vet. It was <laughs> had to put you down. <laughs> I probably would have done. Yeah, I took one look at it and thought <laughs> he's not long for this world. <laughs> You've been fortunate enough to cover Speedway at the highest level on TV and obviously MotoGP. Have you noticed? Did you notice much of a difference between the riders, kind of their attitudes and and their personalities, or do they still got that same? The, the raw bit is across the board. They've all got the same I want it kind of attitude. It's, all, it's in there. It's inbuilt into somebody that's, that's you know, risking their neck, that's, that's going quick, that's, that's, you know, that side of things. And analysing their own sport and what they need to do to go quick. Um, where I have a huge amount of respect for, for the Speedway guys is, is, again, it's like NASCAR, if I might make a, an analogy that is just going to be awful because everyone's going to go, NASCAR? It's that kind of very basic bit where you're chasing the track all the time. You're making minute adjustments to, to make you and the bike go the best on that particular track. As that track changes through the night, NASCAR does exactly the same on tarmac in ovals. You know, when the sun moves around and starts cooking the other side of the track, you've got to make adjustments every time you make a pit stop to make it hook up for that part of the track because it's changed in its grip level. And the same thing with Speedway. I've always been really impressed with the way 
you guys managed to make something from virtually nothing. Like we're all scratching our head, calling it, it's a dark art, this show or stuff, you know. Well, it is to us because we don't know what we're talking about, really. But but to the Speedway Rider, making those changes, you know, it's, it's like second nature. It's like hooking into it. You're part and parcel of it all. When it comes to the road racing side, in my era, it was a cross between what's now and Speedway. You know, it, you had a couple of clicks on the front, a couple of clicks on the rear, and run what you brung, effectively. Tyres were absolutely rubbish. You know, you, you, you had a power band of 2,000 RPM, perhaps on a two-stroke 500 or something like that, which was huge power for... For, for no grip and for, for you know, it banged it all in in one go. So there was a lot you had to manage. You had no traction control. You had no engine management systems. You had no inertial platforms and all the stuff that we've got now. The ECU was about as basic as basic could be. In fact, we might have even had points. No, we didn't. No, we didn't before you go there. <laughs> but <laughs> what a, what the technology point. has obviously <laughs> yeah. moved on. Psychology, That's that was the thing that you started off with. Now, did we have anybody who looked after us? No, you know. You'd get home and someone would say to you, why didn't you go faster? You know, that was about the, 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 the strength of it. And while I'm on about strength, this is something you'll be very familiar with as well, Scott, in, in your era particularly. Suddenly, you know, at the end of my era, we started to realise that there was a bit more to the physicality of things. I mean, yeah, I used to run, I used to train, I used to do all the bits and pieces that everybody does as an absolute basic now. But there I'd be and I'd have this great big grip in my hand because... I was weak and I had to, and I'd run like miles and miles and, and I'd have this gripping man because I'd have trouble with, with my arm. It would just wouldn't suddenly work about three quarters of the way. Arm pump, you know, they have carpal tunnel, which is now a normal thing. If, if you don't have both carpal tunnel done at some stage in your early career, then you ain't a man effectively or a woman, if it, you know, in the case of Anna Carrasco or somebody like that. But carpal tunnel syndrome is you just basically, your muscle's too big for the bit of bloody gristle that's holding it in place. So they slit it open it out. I don't know whether you've had it done. I haven't. Um, Obviously but, not strong enough. Well, <laughs> Nicky, Nicky Peterson's had it done. I know that from a speedway perspective. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, but that was just to fight off other competitors, not race. <laughs> 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 Nicky P, that is a star. Hey. <laughs> but, he, he, and you talk about the psychology. I mean, I don't think there's anyone on the speedway scene that's as mentally strong as that guy. And it's almost interesting that, you know, this whole psychology, is it just picked up from a few of those hardened nails back in the day and they're just that kind of, well, actually I'm going to contradict myself because there's that never will succeed. I saw a sports psychologist for a short period of time that actually made me worse in a way because there's all this blame game and it's just not you, it's someone. I was like, no, I read like an idiot. I deserve, oh, no, don't be hard on yourself. It's always someone else. And it's almost a bit like this blame society which is i'd have liked to have been on that conference how many bloody dead doctors you have in it about six they're all having a conference over <laughs> scott nichols none of them could work me out no, I'm they sure. all they all waved a white flag at the end and sent him back <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, and they went off to see their head doctors after speaking with you <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you know yeah thanks key one of the worst interviews i ever had but i mean it's very it's very common that we talk to people about the sort of cigarette paper difference between good, very good, and great when it comes to people. And, and you had the privilege to be up close to Barry Sheen. Now, you know, he, he amazing motorcyclist, but an amazing bloke in a different era. But he must have had something a little bit more than everyone else. Yeah, he absolutely did. Um, and what he had, he was, he was incredibly smart at seeing stuff for what it was and manoeuvring it into where he needed. Very shrewd man, Barry Sheen. I mean, obviously a fast motorcycle racer, but as a, a manipulator of people, no one liked him for it. He could see stuff coming miles in advance. He knew what a broadcaster wanted before they stuck a mic under him. He knew how to get his sponsors in there in a place where they couldn't edit it out. All the old tricks that we're, we're all used to now, of course we are, because we all studied Barry Sheen. I, I was lucky enough to come up alongside Barry um, I was a bit younger, obviously, than him, but but at the time, I, you'd study that kind of character and you'd work out how he did it. It was in an era as well where the motorcycles were were very different from, you know, in, in one grid lineup of motorcycles, there were the factory bikes, three or four of them, and there was the rest. And there would be 10 mile an hour, 20 mile an hour difference in every straight line between them. So it isn't like it is now. In It's much more competitive now. I get slightly wild when, and maybe you're the same, when people talk about the good old days. When it comes to Grand Prix racing, when it comes to tarmac racing, there are no days like the ones we were in. 
these are without any doubt in my mind the best motorcycle racing days on tarmac right the way through from the moto three moto two and moto gp classes i can't remember a better time i can't remember a more competitive time there are going to be people that are, that are going to say that's complete rubbish you know what about barry sheen he was the fastest man ever on, on round spa when it was the long track and he went around several villages and all the rest of it back in the day yes that is very true there were some absolute superstars but i think from a an overall block competitive point of view these are what we will look back on in the future and say crikey they got it nailed you know the rules were right the the conditions were right. The motorcycles were right. Tires, everything was about right during these days. Um, I'm, it's the one thing I'm going to miss not being at trackside is, is seeing how some of the new youngsters come on through. I mean, obviously, watching Marquez come through in the way that he did. He's a remarkable young man. I mean, he, he truly is a remarkable young man. He's tough. He's tenacious. He's family orientated. He's a nice kid. He's, he's not, you know, on the track. He's ruthless, which I think from a speedway. But if he'd been a speedway rider, you'd have loved him. He would have been the Nicky, Nicky Pedersen on steroids. Um, you know, he, he, he know, he's just, I mean, awe of the kid. I think that the, what he's been able to do and the way he's got over some of his injuries, this one he's having a right old struggle with. But then again, it was really a career-ending injury that he had. Um, no, today, now, are. Uh, the great days for me. Do you think someone like Marquez, I mean, phenomenal talent. I mean, yeah. I mean, the other guys in the paddock, I mean, there's that period where it was, the talk was who was going to come second because it was already given he was going to win. I mean, mentally that must've just destroyed the opposition because he was pulling stuff on a bike that was beyond point of balance. Do you think, you probably know the answer, but do you think he would have been as competitive back in the Barry Sheen day on the totally different motorcycle? Do you think it's just that raw talent he's got? It's actually a better question than you just put yourself down for there, Scotty, I think, because, you know, different people handle different things in different ways. And the era that I was in, the inaccuracy of it, the the everybody out on the piss every single night, everybody smoking and drinking and, and you know, some of them taking, you know, drugs and the like, or, you know, on the trip. I mean, it used to be a well-known fact that drugs used to get shipped from country to country when we had carnets. And then we're going back to the day, you know, Brexit, they're all screaming and shouting about at the moment. Well, Brexit was a thing once. We used to have it. We used to have carnets and every country you went through in Europe, you had a different currency to deal with and a different set of forms that you had to go at every border. So good old days, hey? Yeah, good old days. <laughs> That's one thing that you can do. with it. All you needed was lots of caps and lots of stickers to give to the <laughs> yeah. border guards. And it used to get that, that was your currency. But I wonder whether he would have been able to handle the, the olden days because they were a bit rough, ready and wild. You know, maybe he wouldn't have made it as well without that, that technical ability that he's got for perfection. Maybe the lack of perfection back then may have affected him um, in an adverse way. I don't know. We're never going to know. It's just, a, it's just a guess. But today's top line motorcycle races are as much, you know, they work with engineers, psychologists and the like, and, and data engineers, particularly electronics. It's a major part of it. You know, they don't strip the bikes anymore. We used to have to strip the bikes down to nothing every single night, every time you've done a day's worth of work on them or half a day's worth of work on them. Uh, nowadays, they don't do any of that. They just download a whole load of information and dial in a few more bits and bobs. It's a completely different um, situation. So it's a good question. I don't know whether he would have been just as good. I suspect yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, is the short answer. But uh, it's also when you go the other way and you flip it and you go, you know, Barry Sheen had a bit of a wild child reputation. So did James Hunt in Formula One. And it's interesting if you flip someone like that to modern day, whether they'd be disciplined enough to figure out that they couldn't do that to be successful against all these guys that are really dedicated to the craft. I think that is, a, again, another question that's interesting because, I mean, you know, the Sheeny type days were, you know, would he, would his ego have been able to manage um, another 20 riders on the track that could beat him and had the equipment to do it? suddenly you've got to be on your metal every time you go out there. I mean, every, even free practice now is really, you're practicing to qualify. Your, your free practice really puts you in a, a decent qualifying um, se sector. And if you don't make that, then you're behind the game already. So from the moment you step on the motorbike on a Friday, you have got to, it's like qualifying for qualifying. And then you've got to qualify for the race. So it's very, very strong, very, very strict. And, tiny margins tiny tiny margins to three decibel places now you can sometimes i mean we've had three riders end up on exactly the same time to three decimal places after a track of nearly three miles 
yeah, or, or, and on different manufacturers. I mean, that, I can't say how fine it is nowadays. It is, is it stunning how, how very close road racing is. Um, I mean, again, with Speedway, you know, it's, that is still quite raw. And that, I think that's its appeal to me. Um, it is still quite raw. The rider makes all of the difference, usually physically rather than, you know, it's, it, I don't know. I've, I've never really understood. And I'd have to ask Scott again on this one. I mean, getting a bike to hook up. I mean, why is it sometimes, you know, Thomas Gollop always seemed to, you know, going back an era or two when I was covering it for Sky, you know, Thomas Gollop always seemed to make a bike fast. He always seemed to have a fast bike. Pedersen could have a bike fast sometimes, but not always, but he seemed to be the, the man that could ride through that kind of, that snag. But it's um, almost, it's almost, it, that's, Speedway's way behind in the, the technicality side of it, but the bikes are changing, you know, like the Gollop days, you know, and Hans Nielsen and people like that, they had amazing throttle control. They, the body position on the bike, everything, they, they, they made subtle changes, but a lot of it came from them. Whereas nowadays, the way the bikes are, it's literally, you see the young kids now, they're literally full stop on the line and they don't shut off. If they hit a hole or whatever, they're in trouble. Um, and I think that's where God, when you watched him, the way he worked the clutch and the throttle from the start, I mean, it was like this all the way to the turn. Now it's just pinned. And I think, but now they're athletes, aren't they? Even Speedway. I mean, Brando is at the Grand Prix and when I cover it and you see them, they're like racing snakes, you know, the kind of the party scene has kind of dwindled away now and it's a different era. I was having a bit of a struggle there with Brando and athlete in the same sentence. It's quite tricky. <laughs> I have I have ruptured a patella tendon in my knee, which is an athlete's injury, but I'm not an athlete. You're absolutely right. That was running to the pub. <laughs> <laughs> I was working. I don't know. I mean, I think that that I, I love the fact that they are so different, Speedway and, and road racing, and long may that stay the same. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's a good thing that techn you know, technology hasn't really gone mad on the Speedway bike. I mean, once you start getting into any kind of, you know, control of, of any sort, I, I love the fact that, you know, no brakes, everything done on a throttle. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful sport, uh, not appreciated by as many as it should be. If you go back to the original days when I was like five years old, when I first started going to the track, you know, terraces were full, you know, promoters were promoters were a bigger star as, as the riders quite often. I mean, if I go back to Wimbledon, when I, I used to go to Wimbledon, it was just fantastic. And you'd have, a great big glass enclosure overlooking the, the the main straight and everyone would be in there having dinner. It was like a bow tie job almost. And then you'd have all the, the oi polloi down on the terraces that were fighting and scrapping over their favourite riders. In fact, the first actual big fight I ever saw was at, uh, at Wimbledon. Uh, was it Tom Ledbitter, I think, got stuck in at some stage. I think my Uncle Alan was running around in the background there somewhere as well. It was all hell broke loose. <laughs> it back to the, the, the good old days. Well, I'm actually, I'm going back to Hackney, aren't I? 1995, when uh, Golob got one in the eye. He did, Craig Boyce. Yeah. Boyce, can't beat Boyce. Now, yeah. there's a man that should have gone road racing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But you talk about you talked about it earlier with with Barry being a very smart guy, and 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 you're you're an intelligent bloke, and and like Golob, you know, very intelligent for a speedway rider, and probably knew the mechanics better than anyone else. I mean, I think we saw him at a World Cup once. He stood the bike up on its end and changed the cam timing when he was under two minutes. Now, you know, we did see that. That was on Sky Sports. Yeah, goes out and wins the race. You know, so it, it, again, it's that cigarette paper, whether it's intelligence or, you know, smart or what, however you put it, that little difference is the difference from. There's an empathy with a bike, and speedway riders have it, road racers have it. Mark Marquez, particularly, um, has basically got his entire crew. I mean, you see Mark Marquez when he travels, and, you know, Planes delayed, he and his mechanics, I know this is going to sound slightly strange, but they're all laying on the lounge floor together, all giggling and having a laugh together, all eating together. You know, Mark Marquez has got a very close-knit, Santi Hernandez, his, his crew chief, and all the rest of them all around him all of the time. These are a family that travel together. You know, you pinch one of them, they all feel it. And, you know, the, the guy's got it nailed down, really. I mean, I can understand why he is able to do what he does. And the technicalities of it, Cal Crutch, though, you know, he is able to see all of the data that Mark is, you know, Mark's not shy of, of Honda passing his data to other Honda riders. No one can ride with it. You know, he, he, you know, Cal would say he locks his front brake up every time he goes into a corner. Well, you know, in a road race situation, that's um, you do it once and it scares you enough. So you're a bit, bit earlier on the brakes next time. But he does it all the time. You know, the, his data, which that's the difference between Speedway, I suppose, as well and, and our game. Everything is logged. 
you know, you can download every single thing that's going on. Whatever you're doing is all logged and you can see it. You can understand it. You can analyze it. You know, back in the day when we were on free for all electronics, we're on spec electronics now. So um, they're now across the board. They're the same spec ECU, same spec inertial platforms. So therefore, technically, we're back. We've gone backwards by about seven, 10 years, something like that. The, the original Honda control uh, electronics were in outer space in comparison to everybody else. So Mark was able to tame his bike through the electronics. You could have the, the snappiest motor, both on and off throttle. Um, and it was all controlled through electronics as well as him. Um, but now it's all back to, they're all on a spec uh, ECU and spec inertial platform. That makes a massive difference. So everyone, that's why the, the, the playing field is level. But even with that, Mark's way of riding the bike, when you read the data, is so out of this world. It's why we call him an alien, you know, because only a bloody, you know, space cadet could manage to ride it the way he does. And that, you know, Cal Crutchlow, who I trust implicitly with his opinion, um, says, you know, it's all very well reading his data, but no one can do anything with it. <laughs> but that that's where the team comes into it as well, though, doesn't it? That, like you said, they're all one. And it's he's got the data to back it up, but like in Speedway, mechanics have to be in tune with the rider and, and they see and feel what the rider's feeling. I mean, I've had people work for me over the years where I've come in from a race and I've gone, oh, I'm not sure about this. And they've gone, no, nah, leave it. Just They haven't said you're riding bad. They've just said that. And I know, okay, I wasn't riding very good. You go out there. And I think that's the thing. They know that data and they know that that's how he rides it. And they know those little increments to change, but he's a pretty neat character. There's no doubt about that. I remember one of my sponsors, Arnie Fletcher, up at Lem Manchester Motorcycles in Melton Mowbray, no longer there now. Arnie still is, though. And uh, he said to me, cheapest tuning mod, mod we've got is tune the rider. We ain't going to bolt any new bits on it until you go fast enough. <laughs> Work for us. Yeah. There you go. And, and, and it's funny because we, we, the conversation we've had is sort of crossing over your racing and what you've been able to see in broadcasting. And Scott's got it. And I've been privileged to be up close to the Speedway guys. Where did the when it, when the racing finished for you? How did the broadcasting come about? It wasn't a clean cut situation because I was lucky enough that in my era and Speedway's gone through this exact same situation. Now Scott's in a broadcast situation, which is quite quite amusing for me. In as much as that, well, Speedway riders, to be honest, you said it a bit earlier on, are a little bit behind the road racing, you know, as a comparison. And what happened in road racing was there were very few road racers who could actually speak to camera. You know, when you interviewed and they go, uh, uh, and couldn't get a word out. And so what broadcasters do, because basically broadcasters are lazy. <laughs> they go for the, the easy one. Barry Sheen was an, e you were going to get straight away what you, as soon as you stuck a mic under his mouth, you knew you were going to get your interview and got your, got your broadcast nice and clean. Next up was the likes of me, you know, Ron Aslam, wasn't interested in speaking to television, wasn't interested in getting involved in it, came across that way. So they didn't really bother with Ronnie, even though Rocket was really, really fast on the track. So it was a, a funny situation that what happened was sort of very early 80s. In fact, even you know, right from when I, I won my first British Championship in 1979. And right from that day, broadcasters, if they were on site, would come to me and ask me if I would commentate with Chris Carter, as it was back in the day. Fantastic Chris Carter, God rest him. Um, he would get me in the commentary position, feed me full of cakes, biscuits and coffee in the, so I didn't have to pay for any, uh, uh, any of the luxuries of the day. And I'd commentate on the 250 race or something with him as a co-commentator. So I've been commentating since I was probably 25. On, I never took it seriously and I never thought it would turn into a, a proper job. Is it a proper job? No, it ain't actually a proper job, is it? No. <laughs> I tell, tell you what, this actually leads on real nicely because you've gone from your racing and we're now going to go into the presenting and the media side of things a little bit so that would suggest to me that you've got more than one talent Keith so <laughs> you know we've got this little feature we call talent with a talent so have you got anything for us I'm talentless no nah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry it's under the desk <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard a thumb <laughs> it's uh, all of my all of my talents are outdoors uh it's uh you know I mean I, it's a funny thing isn't it I mean I I'm actually quite boring because all I was interested in was racing. And even though I'm in my 60s now, it's still the same. It's a bit sad, really. I mean, like, I would still go to a racetrack now for, for pleasure. Um, I, well, in fact, I, did, <laughs> I have done the last couple of weeks. I was at Alton Park wandering around with my old mate Julian Ryder, like a couple of punters. And you just, you can't not be trackside. I love being trackside. 
my my probably one of my talents is is, is children I, I seem to have four of them is that a lot i don't know probably it is but um you know i've got all girls which is you have to be sort of talented to just do that i think don't you well there you go well I tell you to be fair um brando showed me a picture which uh the, the viewers will get to see in a little bit maybe but looks like back in the day you had a talent with a hairbrush <laughs> I still got that talent because I brush it just forward <laughs> enough now. <laughs> that talent hasn't gone, mate. <laughs> it never goes. It's like riding a bike. Very talented Barnet has Keith Hewan. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Go. So, anyway, yeah. So we'll go back into the media side of things. Then, so you didn't take it overly serious as a twenty-five-year-old, but you've made a, a fantastic career of it and done a, a bloody good job. I mean, obviously, you come onto the speedway, and, and I was privileged enough to to be in the studio a couple of times, probably for the wrong reasons. But um, how did you, I know we spoke about it a little bit, but how did you enjoy coming into the Speedway scene? Obviously you had a history of it from your uncle, but to be presenting it, that must've been pretty cool. You're right. That's the right word. It was pretty cool. I was still able to cover the sport. I mean, Speedway, Speedway is in your heart when, when, when you're part of Speedway, you know, all right, I was a road racer and, and you know, the major part of it, I'm about to make a comparison I shouldn't make, really. Murray Walker. Murray Walker was a, a, a bike man at heart, but known for being a car man. You know, I'm a road race man at heart. Uh, sorry, a road race man that I'm known for. But, of course, at heart, Speedway was, was a major part of my family and my early life. So I have hugely, you know, lovely memories of being at the Speedway track. The <laughs> that they are. <laughs> unbelievably bad i mean when i think about it there's no way you'd choose to be a speedway fan if you were looking for hospitality really is there i mean there are places that, that are okay but but generally speedway is is um it's it's pull your coat up stick your umbrella in the air and duck the shale pie and chips yeah pie and chips and the like which again i would still choose to do and go to it's it's still raw it's still raw and i think raw is raw is still one of the appeals of it but it's probably one of the biggest enemies of it in that there's certain things that people accept as raw and not accept as raw anymore. Well, it's worse than that, Brando, isn't it? Because all your bloody media and your corporates and the like ignore it for that reason, because it's not in the, I don't know whether this is true or not, it's not an ABC1 sport or something. It's not the kind of thing that a you know, politician would go along and try to you know, go and kiss the kids and, and, and shake the hands of the, uh, unfortunately, uh, and Speedway is always going to have that problem because it's not fashionable in the classes that rule the country. Um, so therefore it's generally ignored from a grant point of view, from a, uh, from a planning point of view, it's, it's not big enough anymore to really influence the influencers. And even, even, even road racing, racetracks, I mean, Johnny Palmer, Jonathan Palmer, who, who, who owns through his consortium the main tracks in this country now, Dr. Jonathan Palmer, who was my teammate at SDC Builders over at Bedford, believe it or not, him in Formula, Formula One and me in 500 Grand Prix. I mean, Johnny Palmer, you know, very shrewd, very sharp fella, but even he hasn't been able to manipulate the politicians into allowing his tracks to have more than 4,000 people in. You know, we've got knock, knock Hill, 1,000 people in a place that's, 250 acres yeah it's just crazy outdoor sport and they're not whereas you look at Wimbledon on TV at the moment you look at the football matches you know Corona going up everywhere else but no you, you can't you can't stand in a 250 to 500 acre field um well distance from everybody you can only have 4,000 people at that maximum it's just crazy I, and it's down at the end of the day it's, it's going to be down to politics because we do not have the right lobbyists yeah, you know, where's our lobbyists for our two-wheel sports? Where's where's our political lobbyists? Every other sport has a lobbyist. You can be bloody sure there's someone down in the football fraternity that's that stood in the, the gates of Westminster, you know, cajoling every single politician as he walked through the gate um, about football things. Where's ours? Who have we got? We've got the bloody useless ACU, the Order Cycle Union, that never do anything, um, particularly apart from sign off licenses and, and, and have committee meetings. The FIM don't lobby in this country at all. Um, which is a shame, the main overall arching you know, governmental body for, for motorcycle sport. And I just think, where are these people? Why, why, why is this not happening? Why are we not paying? Why is, and I suppose it's a question I, I shouldn't ask you. I should ask Jonathan Palmer because he is a big mover and a big shaker. Why is JP not funding a lobbyist to get more people into it? Why, why, why are we not doing this? It is a huge shame, massive shame. And, and for me as a, as a speedway rider, um, 
you know, when I talk to the likes of yourself and and some other really, really high profile, not even just motorsports, but people where you hear it so often. I know Brando will back me up on this. Um, oh yeah, I used to go to Speedway. Oh, my, my uncle used to go to Speedway. And it's like, but why no more? Because the formula hasn't changed. It's just, it's not ticking that box. And it's, it's such a shame. I think kids, I mean, uh, remember when I went to Speedway, you looked across the terrace. No one went on a motorbike. That's to start with. It's not particularly a motorcyclist sport. Um, you do get motorcyclists that go to Speedway, but it's a family sport. You would get the full family. By that, I mean, not just the sons and daughters. You would have uncles, aunts. Everybody would pile in and meet at the Speedway and have a really good cheap day out, night out, whatever it might be. Speedway rises are accessible generally. I mean, they're, they're there on the... They'll sign your autograph. They'll stand in the bloody car park in the rain, sign in whatever you might want, give away stuff all the time. Whereas, you know, in the higher echelons of, of particularly F1, but uh, also MotoGP to a great extent, you know, those guys are inaccessible. You can't get near them. And I think the constitution of some sports is wrong. Again, if I was talking about NASCAR earlier, in their, in the American constitution for NASCAR, you know, they have to spend so many hours at every racetrack doing what they're supposed to do. Their duty, I call it. They're getting paid the most money out of everybody. So they ought to be stood on the fence, signing autographs, giving away hats and all that bloody boring stuff that drives you insane. But that's their job. You know, giving interviews to to the to the anybody that's interested. I mean, it's important that stuff's done. And I, I find it difficult slightly as well when when you know organizing bodies don't make that a stricter rule that you have to do some of that work. There are some people, Valentino Rossi will give up time, always has done, as long as I can remember. There are certain people that will stand there and do it voluntarily, but there are others that run for cover at the first opportunity. And I think though that's a lot of that has to do with sort of almost being self-inflicted in that, you know. They're making hay, speedway's booming, there's thousands of people going, and then, oh, it drops a little bit, drops a little bit, and no one thinks from an organisational point of view, we need to change, we need to put some different plans in place, we need to communicate with the riders and ask them to help us. Because you mentioned yeah. riders in bars. Now, we don't have any Grand Prix riders riding in this country, and most guys are, you know, off to the next meeting. So very few people without COVID, you can't go to the bar. But even in the last five years, Riders haven't really spent time in bars after meetings because they've been off to Poland or off to Sweden. And if people like that bit, being able to go and stand next to a rider and have a pint, and that doesn't happen, there's a reason why they won't go. So it's some of the, it's just very frustrating, isn't it? Because a lot of the answers are there. I think that what, what happens with promoters quite often is that they don't see the wood for the trees. Sometimes they're too busy trying to make a buck to um, see where the next one's coming from. And, and I think that that that's unfortunate. I mean, I, because I live in Northampton, same as you, Brando, you know, Peterborough's quite close. The last few meetings I'd gone to were, were Peterborough because it's just up the road for us. And they made a bit of effort. They had a you know a little bit going on for kids and like the, the worst thing about a speedway meeting used to be when the, the last heat would go and then all the lights would go out. Yeah. And everyone would go home. You know, you were packing up the back of the, you know, and you'd think, hang on a second, this is a real event. And all of a sudden, you know, early evening, really, it, it suddenly lights have gone out, everyone's off. Yeah. It seems like a missed opportunity to me, really, to 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 generate that um, greater family feel for it all. And you're right, the modern day speedway situation is you have mechanics and, and bikes in different countries and you just jump on a jet on Monday morning and go straight to your next one for, for whatever it might be. And then the next one from that. I mean, Crumpy, Jason Crump, who's now obviously got his son, Seth, that's in road racing. You know, yeah. I, saw, I saw Jason the other day. You know, it's... I was amazed at what he used to do. I mean, I was privileged enough to, to, to see him close up, obviously, because, you know, he and I shared a plot of land over for, for, for one point uh, in the old days. And the fact is, is that, uh, you know, when you see, you don't see the dedication that goes into it sometimes with Speedway. It, it seems like a bit of a dirty sport where you just jump on it and ride it. But when, when you see him spending an hour making sure the clutch push rod is, is, is turning just neatly in, in the housing, and when you see the... The, the, the tiny detail that, that he put into to those bikes, and he'd put it in. It wouldn't just be down to his mechanics. He'd be, he'd be working on it. I'm sure, Scott, you're exactly the same. Um, and then you get some riders. I'm, I remember having this row with Kelvin Tatum once. We were at Rotslaff. Um, and I put it to him, why are the British guys' bikes so bloody slow? And he got the right up with me because he said that, you know, I've, he said, I've got to go and talk to these guys. And you're, you're asking me a contentious question on air. And, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they might get annoyed with me if I, if I tell the truth because the bikes were slow. They were crap. You know, why was that? And then when you walk around the paddock, it's because everyone else is throwing new motors out. 
you know, the poles were chucking new motors in there. So it came down at the end of the day to, to funding, which is, the, which is the slippery slope the Speedway in the UK has been on for some time now. Um, you know, you haven't got horsepower and fresh motors go hand in hand. You know, that's, that's what you need. And, and, and that's got to be funded. That's where the road racing guys are a little bit better off. Oh, they are, and it, but it's in, but it is. It's but I think it's the whole the rawness of Speedway that a lot of the riders are quite heavily involved with the mechanics of the bikes, and they want to be involved. It's more of a more of a hands on sport. Um, but it's interesting what you said way back about when you went to the Speedway as a young kid that the promoters were the stars of the show as well. They did what, as Brando quotes it, what it says on the can. They were promoters. Um, now you don't really see them, and I think that's. Is it lost in translation? It's a simple terminology. Look it up in the dictionary. If they if they maybe did what their role was, then maybe the sport would be in a better position. Well, you've got superstars like Midlow, Roscoe, you know, um, uh, Wolverhampton management. You know, there are certain people that try quite hard with their with their stuff. I mean, there there will be others, but ones that I don't know perhaps um, because I I don't go to Speedway that often. You know, like it's it's something that I just don't do nowadays. Sam Malenko still have a Tuesday night with him in the Thai restaurant in Kettering. You know, it's, it's Sam will, he's a great guy, Sam. I mean, when you've got people like Sam that are on the periphery of the sport, really, I mean, he ought to be front and centre, like you, Scott. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, advocates for, for your own game is, is important. And it's, it's, it's just a shame that um, more superstars aren't sort of involved or, or should I say paid to be involved. You can't do it for nothing because everybody's got to, earn a, got to earn a living. You can't. And that's the problem with Speedway. You drop off the edge of the earth when you finish racing. You know, if you ain't made enough money, you've got to go back to a normal job. I'm all right. The earth's flat. I'm not dropping off. Good man. He doesn't want to get too close to the edge, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm conscious of not going on for too long, but one of the one of the things we've talked about a lot is the camaraderie in, in motorcycle sport, the, the team aspect of it. How much, as a, a racer, appeals when you get into the team that's involved in doing television, doing broadcasting. Great thing about television is you still get a fair size adrenaline rush if you're the presenter particularly, not so much a commentator. That's a different situation. I mean, I love commentary because it's something you haven't got to worry about the third dimension. You're only you're only a two-dimensional player in it, really. Um, when you're presenting, it's a three-dimensional thing, which is much more difficult. It, it doesn't seem like it is, but it is because you've got to learn to walk and talk and be paying attention. And when you're concentrating on, you know, looking good, you know, you imagine how hard I had to do that. <laughs> Naturally, Keith. Have hairbrush, will travel. It's tricky. I mean, like, you know, you had to face the wind just in case it blew the flap up, that kind of thing. It was a proper ball ache. <laughs> Chat door. <laughs> but I, I think that, presentation and, and we touched on this earlier on in this conversation presentation the only reason i became a television presenter was because a there was a massive gap no one was really trying to fill it back then whereas now you've got a bloody herd of people trying to be presenters but back in the day there were no real presenters and b and this was the factor that really answers all the questions it was double bubble for being in the same place at the same time so basically i got paid as a presenter and a commentator and managed to make a niche for myself. It's very rare that people commentate and present, um, but that's how Sky did it. And then BT now uh, are doing a similar sort of situation where you know your presenter is also part of your commentary team. Um, but it was money at the end of the day. You got paid 250 quid a day for being a commentator, and you got paid double that for being a presenter and a commentator. You were still on the same site. It was still the same amount of hours, just double the money. Um, I was, I mean, to, to, to be fair, um, I wasn't a great presenter. I was enthusiastic and I knew my sport, but I wasn't a natural presenter. I mean, it's, it, you know, presentation skills are, are quite difficult. And, you know, like being able to walk, talk, you know, engage is tricky for me. I found it quite difficult because... And, on, and listen, people don't realise how much you have going on in your ear. Exactly that. I was you just you just stole the words right out of my mouth, and that's the bit. I you know you get you get people that you know they say, well, we, we need thirty seconds worth of words. Ah, thirty seconds. I can't remember the next ten seconds. If you wrote me down a list now and said, "Here's ten seconds worth of words," I'd read them to myself, read them to myself, and I'll try to repeat them, looking straight down the barrel of the camera. I wouldn't be able to. I'd do them in my own words, but never. 
you know, and they might overrun by a second or they might underrun by a second. And bloody broadcasters hate that. You've got to be on the on the second all the time, you know. And when you know Brando, they're in your ear hole. In fact, what am I saying? You don't, Brando. So does so does Scott now, because being a presenter, you've got an earpiece in, you've got a gallery of 20 people. They've all got to hit their marks. It's a broadcast. You're only part of it. They've got to hit their marks to the second. Otherwise, they overrun a break, underrun a break, whatever it might be. My favourite one was when Martin Turner, who's a very good friend of mine and the, the original executive producer of all the bike sport on Sky, did the, the, did the, the tracks, music to sports videos originally when it was Eurosport, when before it morphed into Sky Sports. Martin Turner, a, a, the only BAFTA winner, to not my knowledge, at Sky Sports. So that was for the rugby, not for the, for the bikes. Absolutely pioneering uh, producer. Everything since really has been after what Martin Turner did. With respect to all the other producers, there's only so much you can do. And he had massive budget as well, as it turned out, back in the day, which makes a big difference. But that guy used to coax you into doing things that, or me particularly, into doing things that I didn't think I was capable of doing. He would produce me. I think nowadays, everybody is in such a position where they're so understaffed in a gallery, they haven't got time to produce the, the talent anymore. They haven't got time to look after the... The, the person, girl or boy, that's doing the auto cue or, 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 or whatever they're doing. There's no time for, a, for a, a director or a producer to be able to do all of those things anymore. It's been, I think we've seen the halcyon days of broadcasting. That was Sky back in the day. Massive money, chuck everything at it, kitchen sink as well. Produce the best programs you can produce. Buy the best people you could buy to get in on it. But we've gone the other way now. I mean, I'm hearing all sorts of things from different broadcasters at the moment where people are being laid off because they've got to save 10% this year or whatever it might be on the broadcast budget. Got to do this, got to do that, got to cut corners. Uh, my own situation is, is wrapped up in that as well. There's always an underlying reason for why, you know, you step off the roundabout as I have. You know, there's, there's I think people are up against it a little bit. And now there are many, many more people that want to be in it. So many, many more people will do it for virtually nothing. You know, it's a situation where that's the way broadcasting has gone. It's not it's not the greatest place to be anymore, apart from the fact you are covering the sports you love. And that bit we'll always miss. I certainly will. It's funny how funding is the un underlying word, isn't it? Funding makes a successful motorsports team or a successful football club, a successful speedway sport. Maybe Poland's got funding. We haven't. So their league flourishes. Speedway doesn't hear funding. It's a big word that. Is the, is the a successful and evil thing at the same time? Well, uh, I mean, I love that old evil thing because the, the evil thing is catching up on all of us. And it's going to be very interesting to see where broadcasting goes. The one thing I can tell you now, nothing ever stays still. It's like technology. But broadcasting, broadcasting at the moment, everybody's trying to nip a little bit of money out of it at the moment because everybody's they're trying to pull back the budgets. The budgets are, are out of control for, for rights issues, for for talent issues, for talent for anybody that um, is listening and wondering what I'm talking about. That's the word they use for the likes of me, Scott, and Brando. We are talent. We are the, the, the people that are on commentary or in, in front of camera. We're known as talent. They've missed out the less on the back of my, <laughs> my word. But anyway, um, so... Or lack of. <laughs> talent has got to come down in price. But the only reason these guys, the broadcasters are having to do this, I mean, BT. BT, we finally find out BT Sport's up for sale. Now, that's a strange situation. Not up for sale per se, but they want an investor to come in and fund part of BT Sport. And I can see within five years, broadcasting will com be completely flipped on its head. Amazon, Netflix, somebody that we never, ever heard of is coming in and will take over sports as we know them right now. The funding will come back in because it always does. It's always front loaded. Loads of funding will come back in and the merry-go-round will go around again. And everyone will be earning a, a fortune again and we'll all be back on the run and it'll be great stuff going on. And slowly but surely they'll start nipping it. You'll start going from first class to business class to economy class. Everyone will be starting to it'll be back in the back of the plane. And you, I can see by the way you're laughing at me, Brando. And it's the way it goes. We all started travelling first class, you know, when the broadcast first starts and then slowly but surely as the budget gets nipped, you're ending up in the back. Yeah, first first world problems, and I can hear a lot of people at home groaning at that. Well, <laughs> it's true. It's it's very true. You know, like it just, and it's. I think it's everything. Everything goes in cycles, and it's just riding the wave and keeping up with where we're at. I'm waiting till flares come back in. <laughs> Not sure. Well, come to Brighton, mate. Everything goes, so you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's where the zip is on that. <laughs> yeah. Before we get to the um, 
kind of the end of the the show bit, which is a little bit of fun. Um, you spoke about being coaxed into things by the uh, the producer and things like that. Were you ever fortunate, good teammates, were you ever fortunate enough to be coaxed into Barry Sheen's pre-race ritual? Were you ever that fortunate? Uh, no, um, <laughs> not not by any of his girlfriends anyway. <laughs> Barry, had, Barry had quite a lot of rituals. Um, Carl Fogarty had a few rituals. He's got his his, his favourite shirt hanging on his wall in his kitchen. You know, there, there are rituals. You know, Valentino Rossi readjusts his leathers that are stuck up his backside every time he goes down pit lane on the way out. Did you have any? Do I have any? Or did you when you were racing? Yeah, you, I mean, I, I, I struck. It's the, it's the, it's the politically correct world, isn't it? Where you can't use certain phrases. Like I remember using OCD once in something, and I got slammed and trolled like mad on Twitter. You can't say you're OCD. That's a, that's a recognised illness. Some bloody moron came back and gave me a real hard time over it. I had a minor de, my, detail. Is my problem. I, I struggle. I have to have detail. While we speak, there's a conservatory being bolted to the back of my house, and I noticed there's 20 mil difference in in something out there. And I, I, I'd walk past it, and I could see 20 mil. Like you might as well have hit me with a sledgehammer. So, you know, when I walk into a room and I see electric sockets, if they ain't in line, mate, I have a problem with that. Screws in hinges. Screws in hinges. Why do they put cross cut screws? They've got to be in line. I'm sorry, it's normal. What's wrong with you people? So um, there are certain things that I can't get over. <laughs> Scott, the last lap, he's ranting. <laughs> it is, I think so. Right, so we got the last lap questions for you, Keith, so you've got to be primed and ready. Brando's going to kick him off for you nice and easy. <laughs> we'll start with a simple one. It's the old, the old beauty, snog, marry, avoid. Your three candidates are, in no said order, Cameron Diaz, bit of a race chick, Pink, the singer, and a real racer, Dana Patrick. Snog, marry, avoid. Well, you'd avoid Dana Patrick. Dana Patrick, I mean, she's fantastic. And, but you can believe that someone that's very similar in personality to yourself, you would never want to marry ever <laughs> in a million years because you're going to be in de- de- real big trouble. Um, the other two, I'd snog. In fact, I would ma- I'd only marry my missus. Oh, look at this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know we can edit this out, Keith, so. Yeah. <laughs> No, he's leaving. I've only, I've only ever had one marriage today. How about that? <laughs> hey, that's that's got to be a record, isn't it? So have I, and it didn't work. <laughs> anyway, moving on. I'm <laughs> saying <Smithly. nothing. laughs> So moving on. Number two, I'm quite liking the look of this one. Are you a member of the Mile High Club, Keith? Yes. Yay, we got one. Hey! <laughs> South African Airways. South African Airways on my way down to uh, Johannesburg. There you go. Please don't give us a flight number of the day. You can look anything up on the internet <laughs> yeah. these days. Um, we'll, we'll move it on. It's a first, pilot. <laughs> first one in six programs. In, <laughs> yes. Did you say he was a pilot? <laughs> <laughs> His name was Jim. <laughs> we we got to move on. Um, what what we we you mentioned ACU earlier, but what does this well known acronym not stand for? R A C. Well, it don't stand for Royal Automobile Club, does it? <laughs> it certainly doesn't stand for that. I don't know. You can make it up as much as you like. Acronyms. I did the ACU. I mean, the RAC, they've always treated me all right, actually, the RAC, I've got to say. When I wanted a, an international race car licence, they actually gave me one. But um, ACU is another cock-up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we'll do that one. All right, then. Your first celebrity crush. Ooh. First celebrity cl- crush. Oh, blimey. Um, now, t- the trouble is, Scotty, that when you get to my age, you know, every time you go around the goldfish bowl, you see another castle. Nice castle. <laughs> nice castle. <laughs> I've only got a three-second bloody jail now that I work to. <laughs> we'll go with Cameron Diaz then. <laughs> oh, Cameron Diaz, now she's a bit young for me, really. If I go back, you've got to go to Bridget Bardot and they're like, you've got to go back that far for, for me, haven't you? The, the, the crush as a, as, a, as a teenager, you know, when you, you know, your mum used to come in in the morning and say, what's that lump in your bloody sheets? You know, it's kind of... <laughs> It's 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 got to go right back to the old. You're playing with the Airfix models again, have we? <laughs> talking, you're talking Joanna Lumley before she did train rides, aren't you? Um, <laughs> all right. Um, what's better, Keith, sex or winning? Oh, nightmare! That is a nightmare. Well, I'm if surprised. I'm doing it, if I'm doing it, it's got to be winning. <laughs> <laughs> all righty, all right. A little simple one for you. 
Socks on in bed, yes or no? Absolutely never. Agreed. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, well, there's another nice easy one. Have you ever had a wee in the shower? Yeah. <laughs> this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you got a better memory than you thought, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's only because I forgot to shut the door. <laughs> what are the builders were anyway. Moving on. It wasn't um, to out, was it? <laughs> across. <laughs> uh, what are you scared of, Keith? Being unsuccessful. I tell you what, mate. That's a serious question because uh, I've got kids. Um, I mean, I'm really scared of mucking up in being a good dad and I'm not a particularly good dad because the trouble is that I love to be away from home I really genuinely do and it's a real conflict in life right to this day this is a major discussion piece just in the last couple of days around here you know I've got a six-year-old a 16-year-old an 18-year-old and a 31-year-old all daughters three of them obviously living with me now and it's I, I really 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 worry about mucking up and uh, and and it's kind of you know, you hope that you're giving them what they need for their futures, because I, I think their, I wouldn't want their futures the way it is. It's bloody hard work nowadays. Social media, we went into it before. Long answer to what should have been a short question, but um, there you go. I'm, I'm, I'm scared of mucking up with my family. The answer's the answer. Cool. Um, another simple one. Uh, text or call? Well, if I want to get it done quick, text. If I want to talk to a mate, call every day. I mean, call, calling is it's old school. And if you want to, if you want to have a conversation with somebody, never text, never email. They're there for business, really. Right. Well, talking of text, we've got the last little bit of the show is uh, called the rude tongue twister roulette. So <laughs> <laughs> easy for you to say. <laughs> yeah. I bet you can't do it again. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to roll the dodgy dice. And then there's going to be six options of a rude tongue twister come up and there's going to be one fired over to you very shortly. So your tongue twisters are, we have got number one is a pheasant plucker. Number two is puggy wuggy. Number three is fig plucker. Number four is sock cutter. Number five is mother hunt. And number six is Susie sitting. So is there any of those that you're feeling like you don't really want to tackle? Well, I couldn't do Susie City, could I? Because I might get into trouble. If Susie Perry's listening ever, then that could be a real difficult one. So I've got to avoid that one. i tell you what, we'll roll the dodgy dice. Just hit the dice now uh, and let's see what happens. Ironically, no one's had number six yet, which is Susie Sitting. So, um, Susie Sitting, is that? Yeah, Susie that's sitting. it. Let's see what happens. So we have got your number is six. So you have got <laughs> Susie Sitting. How could I have guessed it would be Susie Sitting? <laughs> so if you take a look on your phone there, Keith, I've sent the... Uh, the tongue twister to you. Hang on. Hang on. I didn't want you cheating. I've got to look for my glasses now as well, haven't I? I've got to read something off my phone. Hang on a second. Got to find your glasses for your glasses. No, no. Here we go. Right. So you're a professional key. So straight off the bat, fast as you can. Hang on. Hang on. What's it on WhatsApp? Yep. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. You're talking about a bloke here with technology. It's a nightmare. What was he saying earlier about technology? Uh, yeah. He huh? was right. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. Three, two, one, go. I saw Susie sitting in a shoe, shine shop. Where she sits, she shines. And where she shines, she sits. <laughs> <laughs> He's the ultimate professional. I was really hoping you'd trip up. Susie will be proud of you. Yeah. We don't need to do that again. He's, uh, he's nailed it. <laughs> yeah, he has. So. Uh, Keith, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Um, it's been really cool taking a look back at your career and all your insights. And, uh, yeah, thanks an awful lot for joining us. Well, thanks very much for asking us. I do appreciate it. And it's good to see two old mates as well, isn't it? Eh? You don't look any prettier, the pair of you. <laughs> Put them glasses back on. Hang on a second. Oh! <laughs> you look much better now. Cheers, boys. Ah, oh, they, they suit you, though, Brando. You look about right in them. Thanks, mate. You're welcome. Cool. Well, Brando, old Keith, he's got some stories, but what a, what a cool guest to have on. Yeah, I mean, a guy that's got so much experience in terms of racing motorcycles, he, he knows about Speedway, it's, it's in his heart, he said it himself. Um, and then to move it into other things, to be able to talk about those days, these days, these days, those days, and his broadcasting career. So, yeah, great guest and, and really a, a real speed freak. He certainly is, and uh, an absolute pleasure to have him on. Hope you guys enjoyed it at home. Thanks for watching. Huge thanks to our title sponsor, ATPI Travel. Make sure and check them out. All of the Instagram followers and all the socials will be at the end of the show. So until next time, see you soon.
ATPI, delivering what really matters.